Uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, well sustained for the rest of the day. Only 20 minutes to go. As well. um, so I'm a geologist, and the problem that a geologist has is that we are split. We have a kind of slightly um, schizophrenic view of the planet. Um, so there I am on the top, um, looking masterful on an ice sheet, because part of one of the things we do is understand, try and understand the rhythms of the planet, the thresholds, particularly in terms of climate change, because the geological record gives us a chance to show how atypical the situation is uh, in, uh, since uh, in the last couple of centuries in relation to the long breadth of geological time, separating out natural variability from, from human induced stuff. Um, but then the other side of geology is below, and that is that we go and find stuff. And we find stuff that keeps modern society going. We go and find oil, we go and find resources, it's a gold mine in Australia, and, and therefore we are the facilitator for the exploitative aspect of the, of the, uh, of the planet. We've already heard about aspects of overconsumption, what that's driving. So the oddity of it all is that we are both the Earth's steward, or we would see ourselves the Earth's stewards, and also as earth exploiters. And really that balancing act that geology does is essentially the balancing act of sustainable development. How do you allow uh, the, the world and particular economies to develop in the ways that they want to do without bringing in, um, bringing in problems to the natural tram lines within which the natural systems, the coping mechanisms of the planet operate? Um, so, uh, uh, the key thing really for me is, is this business about how we ma manoeuvring our way through those, those either aspects. So the stuff I'm going to talk about is at a, as a broad scale. And I want to introduce to this guy, this is a geologist who I think epitomises the dilemma of that split uh, personality. This is George P. Mitchell. Uh, George P. Mitchell is one of the most successful Texas oilmen there's been. He was a, a wild catter uh, that used his geological expertise to find more oil than probably anyone else has, has ever done. And in doing so, um, became uh, very, very rich. Um, but he was also uh, instrumental in driving forth in Texas environmental uh, sustainability. He was a developer of the, the Woodlands um, community, some of you may know, which is just north of downtown uh, uh, Houston. It's an area of a kind of planned community whereby government uh, subsidised housing sits cheek by jowl with millionaire homes in an area where the tradition of the timberlands were preserved. Uh, there was the uh, care about the management, mandatory regulations about the environment, reducing of flooding, and an attempt to live in what we refer to as a pleasant environment. By 2010, and, and, uh, and like, I think there's some like 100,000 people living in that, that area. Um, I said he made a lot of money. Um, in 2004, his wealth was estimated at 1.6 billion. He, um, the, he was, as a result of that, also a, a really prominent philanthropist. It's estimated he's given away about 400 million, and the vast majority of that is to science, and environmental uh, science uh, causes, particularly in the area of clean and sustainable energy. Um, he uh, was one of the, his foundation subsidised the work or, or uh, helped promote the work of Dennis Meadows, and some of you will know the name, who was the academic that was behind the limits of growth uh, uh, report that really brought sustainable science uh, and, and across, a, a kind of, across the kind of world, uh, a kind of wake up call really for environmental uh, uh, concerns. <coughs> And, you know, the Woodlands Conference for Sustainable Development is quite prominent. Uh, there's a, the American National Academy of Sciences. It's got the, it's got the Mitchell Endowment for Sustainability Science. Uh, and he's developed, he founded and bankrolled an interdisciplinary research centre, the Houston Advanced Research Centre, that is, looks at strategies for sustainable development. My point is, this is someone who you'd think has got impeccable environmental credentials. The interesting thing is that George died a couple of years ago, isn't going to go into the history books as a Texas oilman uh, in terms of what he found for oil. He's not going to go into the history books in terms of philanthropy, and he's not going to go into the history books in terms of sustainable science. He's going to be going to the history books because he's the father of fracking. He brought in fracking. 
Hydraulic fracturing in his backyard was what he developed over the last 20 years. And what I think is interesting about this is not that, that he developed it. He was a successful oil man and it makes kind of sense if you're trying to push the frontier. It's that in reading up about George, he was the person who recognised the paradox of his life. That on the one hand, he was out there getting oil and getting rich, or trying to get rich in the face of oil. But the other part of his life was an ardent environmentalist. And what I found really intriguing was his view that fracking provided the unity between those two extremes. Now that is not something you'll see wildly touted in environmental circles, that fracking somehow is the thing that brings sustainability science uh, together. So I was interested in why he felt that. And the reason that he, he felt that was that it stemmed out of his interest in uh, sustainable energy. Now, he was also trying to make money, that's absolutely true. But, the, but one, one of the things that he had a concern about was that rebuilding resilient communities around the world and allowing development would, would require uh, cheap, sustainable energy that was available to local communities. And that for him, this notion of uh, accessing shale rock was key to this. So just to explain, I don't want to go into a geology lecture, but the point shale is mud that's been compressed. That rock is the most common rock in the world. Most of the oil and gas exploration that goes around the world, of, almost all of it, try to source material that has come originally from one of these shale rocks and moved, migrated somewhere else and collects it. So what George Mitchell had recognised in Texas was if you could directly access that shale rock, you could uh, liberate that from, directly from the source you know, the oil or gas that was there. And he recognised that every country, every backyard had shale, and therefore you could do that. So what's been interesting for me, sitting on the edges of the debate about fracking as it's come into the UK, and I made a few programmes on this, is about how, what George Mitchell would have saw as the, kind of, the role of fracking at its gestation has transformed into something um, very different. Now, so at this point, you think, oh my God, has he taken the theme of cracking the earth too literally? Is his great idea for sustainable science really going to be fracking? <coughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. Not quite. For the record, for the UK, I think fracking is not going to be an energy source that's going to be especially deliverable, partly because there's lots in terms of energy, there's lots of other alternatives, and partly because the social acceptance, their license to operate, it doesn't look as if it's going to be there. And there's a whole set of other complicated reasons as well. But it doesn't mean to say that that is the same issue everywhere. And one of the things I think is interesting in terms of looking at sustainable science is the realisation of local solutions and trying to look at places and think, in terms of sub-regions, what is required in different places. Now, I'll give you an example on this, which is that in January I was over in India and uh, it, was a, it was an energy conference and they were trying to look at you know, where they where they're going to get it from. They were very worried the, the energy consumption in India is going through the roof, people are getting more desirable in terms of the, the, the you know, energy requirements for the home, but particularly transportation. The bike has become the moped, which is moving into the small car, which is moving up to the big car. And they are, there are certainly clearly moves in India for, for renewables. The, there's the two kind of main areas, the solar is getting increasing, but it's still very small. But the, the two main areas that are kind of low carbon are nuclear power stations and uh, hydro, huge hydroelectric schemes. Um, and those hydroelectric schemes in particular are concentrated along the Himalayan front and many of the nuclear power stations that are in northern India. And I think the events of the last of the weekend here has put a lot of that back into the perspective about whether that is a sustainable uh, energy source. The other area that India is undoubtedly going to exploit because it has to is coal. It has huge amounts of coal. Coal is cheap. And in fact, the International Atomic Energy um, Authority estimated that coal was the energy for the future for most, most countries. It's the stuff that they have in their backyard. Now, as almost everyone I'm sure in this place knows, is coal is a, a 
appalling in terms of its climate change one. So if you've got a country for India, I would argue that it is an element that if, if fracking for natural gas is something that moves things away from uh, the use of coal in India, then maybe that is a, is a good thing. Maybe that is something to be encouraged. My general point is going to be, is really that I think the complexities and the sheer intractability of some of the issues that we're going to be dealing with in delivering a sustainable development for this planet, given the population pressures and given the pressures that climate change comes in, meaning we are, are facing some unpalatable choices and some mixes of energy and, and mechanisms of change that many of us will not uh, like. So it's simply that, um, and in terms of using fracking, which is a red line for most people, the point is that that not, isn't, doesn't necessarily mean that it's a red line or should be a red line everywhere. Um, that is a coal mine in the, pa in the past. That coal delivered us wealth. And uh, in terms of engineering and driving, fueling the Industrial Revolution clearly has built Britain and many other Western nations. But it's symptomatic of a broader issue, which is that most of the stuff that runs the modern world comes from inside the earth. And that is not something that's necessarily going to change. That even as we move towards a low carbon future and we move away from fossil fuels and hopefully move away from coal entirely, but move and even reducing our fossil fuel, as we move into the renewable area, those renewables too require resources that we will dig from the ground. So we are looking at a step change increase in our mining um, to deliver. And as we fancy these things, and as we fancy our modern electronics and smart technologies and our batteries for new, re new renewables and clever photovoltaics comes in more and more where we require particular metals, particular resources located in specific parts of the world that require us to go in, dig into the earth and get it out. And that, I think, raises some uncomfortable realities, which is that how do we feel about that, what's called the hidden commons? How do we feel about the subsurface? How do we feel about underneath there? And this is one of the general areas that I'm interested in at the moment, because I've got a PhD student working with uh, Sabine Powell in, in psychology, looking at how people perceive the subsurface. But the reality is we've done lots of surveys. I was going to show you some of them, but I'll, I'll probably stay off of that. Is actually people don't think very much about it at all. It's a blank slate. If I asked you now to think about if there, there was a slice down here, what would be down a kilometre beneath the feet? What would it look like? Then many people here would struggle to visualise that. But more than that, would struggle to empathise with what's down there. That is that we have an affinity to uh, the landscape around us. And, and so the loss of woodlands or the loss of something means something to us. The, the effects of the oceans can be brought home to us in various ways, particularly when we see environments like coral reefs that we're familiar with. It's very hard to get passionate about a bunch of rocks a kilometre beneath the surface. And yet, it's going to be absolutely crucial that we build some kind of empathy with the, the subsurface. Um, this is a installation I like. It's at the Greenpeace HQ in, the, in London. It's Andy Goldsworthy. It's called Seven Holes. And um, it, it's a funny story because he wanted to dig in the lobby of Greenpeace down and to create a big hole. Greenpeace said, well, I don't think so. <laughs> Mainly because they're so close to the water table, they were worried about flooding. Um, so instead what he did was the outside, he, he dumped up lots of earth into piles and then built holes. And this is kind of the one of them. But I, I like he's, he's got these holes of a geological a sense of going back in time. Almost every culture up until the modern one has had an affinity with the subsurface. There's a sense that as well, as well as being up there in the stars, down there there is something that we are connected to. But it seems to me that the, in the last, particularly the last 50 years, the great acceleration, as anthropologists call it, with the, the rise of uh, commodities and economic development, is we've disconnected ourselves from where things come from. Got absolutely no idea where they come from. So this mobile phone that I passed around, well, it's got gold in here, it's got various metals. Its main one, though, is something called tantalum, which is a metal in the Democratic Republic of Congo that's stuck in wars. I'm sure you've heard this before. The point is that the, what we use as just the modern part of modern life 
is coming from holes in the ground or from underneath the ground. Um, so, so one of the general aspects that I really kind of want to say is that in terms of us thinking about sustainable development, one of the issues that we have is how do we ensure the stewardship and governance of, of a, a whole domain that we know nothing about and we've got no emotional attachment to? That is going to be really tricky. The, the governance and, and stewardship of the subsurface is something that's out of sight, out of mind. And yet it's impinging increasingly in us. I've been involved in some of the stuff in the southwest to do with geothermal. Um, there's a couple of projects going on in, in that area. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. You know, the Eden project uh, is one of the ones that's going to do it. Um, they're fracking. They're ejecting water down to enhance the permeability of the bedrock, is what it says. They're essentially fracking to, to generate heat. But that idea that we, we don't know what's down there, we're just going to use it, is a difficult one. One of the things apparently that's held back geothermal is the fact that the government hasn't been able to work out how, who owns the heat. Because the water's not coming out, water just turning around, it's not coming out, the, the money's on the heat. How do you tax the heat? So the government lawyers have been working hard on trying to work out how they tax the companies for heat. These kind of questions we don't really know. Issues like carbon capture and storage which is uh, one of the aspects that the IPC says is a really integral part of our campaign for, against uh, dangerous climate change. Absolutely attached to any coal plants, but even outside of coal plants for other ones, carbon capture storage should come in here. No one's very excited about it. Very few of the environmental groups are, are campaigning to have carbon capture storage. Why? Because it's a difficult one. It gives the green light to fossil fuels, etc. But most importantly, when it's come in in other areas, particularly in areas for, uh, in the continent, is that people don't like the idea of some stuff getting put down underneath their feet. And yet, that is one of the techniques that is seen as being a way out for climate change. And then the other thing that's going to be coming back over the next few months, next uh, six months particular, is nuclear waste disposal. Uh, there is a public consultation going on about finding a place to take the waste that at the moment is stored in out-of-date swimming pools up in Sellafield. And somewhere, some community is going to be asked to come forward and, and have a site underneath their feet. And that is not going to be an easy thing to do. And yet it's, a, it's something that has been lumped, we've been lumped with really for at least kind of two generations. What to do about the nuclear waste that we all are getting reduced cost energy from over the last kind of 20 years. So I just want to finish up with talking, just to kind of highlight this one really, in the sense of thinking that what we need is we need a, a, a kind of awareness raising that a couple of things, that, that we've got really difficult problems of trying to manage up sustainable development of young countries that see that have the same desires for economic development as we have had over the last century or so and want that uh, economies to be developed, and that is going to be on the basis of resources that they mine from the ground, and it's going to be on the basis of energy that they get largely still from fossil fuels. And that then is putting a lot of pressure then on our collective stewardship of an environment that we really pay little attention to at all. And so how we actually bring in and develop and encourage good stewardship of the subsurface will be one of the key challenges for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.